to wish all the moms a happy Mother's Day. Uh, we are here to honor God first, but we're also here to honor you and to celebrate you. We recognize all the work that you do uh, that's often unseen and um, unrecognized. So I want you to enjoy today. Uh, take advantage um, of this day and let your family spoil you. Um, no mom guilt today. So we, you know, I also want to recognize that today is not always an easy day for everyone. Um, today can be a day of sadness for some people. Perhaps you've lost your mom, or as a mom, you've lost a child. Um, or maybe you're distant from your mom right now, or as a mom, you're distant from your child. So we want to recognize that also, um, recognize your loss, recognize your sadness, and pray for you as well. So let's pray. Dear Father, we honor you. We give you praise for you are our Creator, our Lord, and our Savior. We thank you that we can worship you today as one body. We thank you that um, we can celebrate our moms today. Thank you for being the ultimate model of parenthood through your unconditional love never ending grace. We pray for um, all the moms of our church. We thank you for the sacrifices that they've made and continue to make as they provide for us, as they teach us, as they nurture us. I pray for the new moms, Lord. I pray for uh, moms of young children who may be feeling tired and overwhelmed. Maybe uh, just adjusting to new changes and uh, trying to juggle a lot of things all at once. And I pray that you would just give them rest. I pray that you would calm their heart and remind them that you are in control, Lord. Lord, I pray for the single moms. I pray that you would surround them with your love, your strength give them comfort as they raise their children on their own. I pray that you would provide for their needs. In fact, Lord, I pray that you would surround them with family and friends that would be there for them to show them that they're not alone. Father, I pray for moms who desire a deeper connection with their children um, as they guide them in the knowledge of you. Would you bring them closer to one another would you build honest and trusting relationships between them? Lord, I also pray for those who are mourning today. I pray for those who lost their moms, moms who lost their child. God, would you bring comfort to them? We know that you are the only one who can fill that loss. And so we lay down any pain, any sadness at the cross, Lord, and we place our hope in you knowing that you love us and that you are in control. And Lord, we pray for our church as we seek to join your work here in Houston and beyond. Show us those who are hurting, who are lonely, who are in need. May we step out of our comfort zone and show them, that you can show them the love that you continue to show us and share the truth that you reveal to us. We pray this in your most holy name. Amen. Amen. It's 
not often in our history books that women are highlighted. That's the sad truth. Christian women even less so. But there are many Christian women in our past who have shaped our communities, their countries, even the world for the better. For each of them, their faith played a major role in their outlook on the world. And their impact can still be felt today. You see, Christian women in our past have shaped, again, their communities and their countries. And even the world for the better, because they joined God's kingdom movement. Now, I want you to think about their lives, think about their legacies of faith, and ask yourself, what is that small thing that might, that God might be calling you, in a way, that could change the world for His glory? An example would be in the book of John, you know, the mother of John the Baptist, Elizabeth, who was married to a priest named Zechariah, in Luke chapter 1. And it tells us that Elizabeth and Zechariah were, were both righteous before God, but Elizabeth was childless. And they were both old in age. And similar to Job's day, people who were childless at the time were thought of people who <coughs> sinned against God, who were not right before God. And so God must be punishing them. But you see, even through this hardship, Elizabeth believed in God, trusted in God. And her faith was anchored in her relationship with God. And it says in Luke 145, And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And God blessed her with John the Baptist. God used Elizabeth to be an example to not only John the Baptist, but to the disciples as well. Another lady is John, uh, born into slavery in Swartico, New York, Sojourner Truth, escaped with her infant daughter and went on to be an abolitionist and a women's rights activist. She is best known for her speech on racial inequalities entitled, Ain't I a Woman? which she gave at the Ohio Women's Rights Convention in 1851. But before she was Sojourner Truth, her name was Isabella. In 1843, she changed her name and had a life-changing experience when she encountered God. She sensed God calling her to adopt the name Sojourner Truth. And she traveled the country sharing the gospel and her testimony. And when they heard these news, her children were horrified because they thought, how could a poor, illiterate, former slave hope to survive as a traveling evangelist and speaker? You see, women weren't, weren't supposed to speak publicly during this era, and she was a former slave. Sojourner assured her family that, again, that God was calling her for something great for his kingdom. And that God, that God would protect her and provide for her. This morning, as I thought about today's sermon, the truth is, it's hard for me to preach on Mother's Day. Because the, the, the truth is, as a man, it's hard for me to, to really understand a woman's perspective. And so as I began to pray for the Holy Spirit's direction, I think I just turned it off. <laughs> God really reminded me that He has a word for our moms this morning. And I asked several women this week, and I interviewed them, I talked to them about what does it mean to be a woman of God? You see, as a mom, yes, you're called to support your husband and your children. But the truth is, more than that, ladies, you are called to be a follower. More than that, you are called to be a follower of Christ. P and I have been married. It's going to be 11 years this year. And she's been supportive to me when I was called into pastoral ministry. When my oldest son was born, she was there. When I went to seminary, she was there. And even when I graduated and I told my family we were going to move to San Francisco by faith, even though we can't afford it, 
and go there and to start a brand new church. She supported me and was my partner in ministry. Throughout those years, even until today, coming here to Houston, she's been supportive and been a partner in ministry. But as a mother, God still had a calling for her life. God still has a calling for your life. It doesn't matter how old you are. And again, her calling in Christ never changed. Though God called her to be a supportive wife, a ministry partner for me, a supportive, uh, a wonderful, godly mother, her calling to become fishers of people never changed. And really, God is in control of our lives and the journey that you're on. And we, make, we might make choices as women that goes against God's will, and there's consequences to those. But that doesn't mean that God is not giving up on you or on us, but He continues to fulfill His good work. And if you are a follower of Christ, you understand that. You have that perspective. You know that His grace is sufficient, and He is there with you. And if we think about today's special day for moms, that if you truly are a follower of Christ, a disciple of Jesus Christ, He ultimately has this great plan for you. A plan to use you for His glory. A plan to enhance you as a woman of God so that you can be utilized not only to be a great wife, great mother, but to be, as Neil said, a spiritual mother to those who may not have mothers. To be an amazing evangelist like Sojourner Truth. To be a gospel bearer of light to those in your workplaces. And it doesn't have to be in a, in a, in a Christian um, setting. I believe God is using you and is planning to use you wherever you are. Because if you think about it, you are created in the image of are you with me? This Mother's Day, I urge all mothers present and future mothers and spiritual mothers, all women of God, to hear what God has for you this morning. Because your response this morning will either propel you or draw you closer to God or it will continue to draw you away. Or in a sense, you would continue to withdraw yourself from knowing who Christ is, your Lord and Savior. Because again, He has a purpose for you. And until you realize that, and until you put your life according to His will, to His plan, then the truth is, you will continue to lack peace. You will continue to lack the love that you truly desire and need in life. A love that your husband can never fully give you. You guys know that. Your kids can never fully give you those. That love, only God can. Amen. Amen. Turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3-9. through 9. The author here is also Paul. Paul was writing to Timothy, his disciple, disciple and mentee. And really, 2 Timothy is a personal letter. To Timothy while he was in prison in Rome. And understand the context here. Paul is facing death. He's facing a death sentence. And he knows death is nearing. And so he writes this personal letter to remind Timothy. And really to remind all of you women to be faithful to Christ. That was his theme for Timothy. To be faithful to Christ. Let's read 2 Timothy chapter 1, 3-9. It says, I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience, as my answers did, when I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day. Remembering your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I recall your sincere faith that first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am convinced is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is in you through the laying of my hands. 
For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. Verse 8. So don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Instead, share in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God. He has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time begun. May God bless the reading of his holy word. This morning, I hope to really allow our mothers this morning to understand that you have a rich heritage of faith. You find this in verse 3 through 5, where Paul himself reminded Timothy about his rich heritage and where it started. And it started with his grandma, Lois, and his mother, Eunice. And I think it's important for us to understand that, that God is working in our families. And it's working in the unions that you have been part of. Even though those sometimes our marriages are not always the best, there's highs and lows, but as followers of Christ, God is working out His will and purpose, which is good. And here, Paul reminded Timothy that he has a rich heritage of faith. And I love this text because again, Timothy's faith did, and, his, and his passion for Christ didn't so much come from Paul. You would think it should come from Paul, who was a great man of God, but no, his sincere faith came from his grandmother, Lois, who set the example of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And then passed it on to his mother, Eunice. Understand, Timothy was half Greek and half Jewish. His dad was Greek. And so as a half Jewish, half Greek, his worldview was different, right? Judaism and Greek. And so it was difficult for him to just to, to figure out what it means to be a child of God. But his grandma and his mother set that example. And so if you are here today, and maybe you're a grandma and your mother, and maybe you guys are the only ones in your family that's following Christ, I want to encourage you that God is using you still. That God has a plan for you to reach your grandchildren or your children. Because He is beginning to do a great work in your life. As I interviewed Nana Rose Golveo, she gave me a rich history of her faith. And in fact, she comes from a great heritage of faith. Her grandma, grandmother, Primitiva, I'm saying it correctly, was a follower of Christ. And then her mother, Carmen, was a follower of Christ. And then now she is a follower of Christ. Michelle is a follower of Christ, her daughter. You see, there is a generational plan that God is doing. And maybe you will say to me, Pastor, but you know what? My mom wasn't a follower of Christ. Well, what I will tell you is, you have a rich heritage of faith. And God is beginning in you. He has to start somewhere. And so you have to look at yourself and say, wow, God has blessed me. God has empowered me to be a light and salt of the earth to my family. Yes, be a supportive husband. Yes, be a caring mother. But more than that, you are a follower of Christ. Don't ever underestimate that God will not use you for, your, for His glory. If you think about the women in our church, we have some powerful women in our church. Amen. And I am so excited about that. Because, yes, we have great mothers in our church, but we also have spiritual mothers in our church, leaders in our church. And we need both great men of God and great women of God in order to fulfill and expand the kingdom of God. Amen? Are you with me? And if we look at, again, Paul.
Paul's reminder. It's because Timothy is at this time was in the church in Ephesus and as a young pastor, he was struggling. Right? He had to understand the culture there, the Christian culture, right? It was difficult for him. And Paul was reminding him to be faithful to Christ. Even though there will be trials, there will be divisions, he says, be faithful. Or remember your great heritage of faith. And so as you continue to celebrate Mother's Day today, maybe you'll be eating later on. Remember your grandmother, your mom, who maybe started Bible study with you, who maybe dragged you to church and you were upset and didn't want to do that. But out of that, the seed of the gospel is planted in you. Now that we've learned that we have a great heritage of faith, we also need to learn that as women of God, we have been empowered by Himself, by God Himself. What did it say in 6 through 7? This is what it says. Therefore, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is in you through the laying of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. This is actually my, one of my favorite verses. If you ever got my email, the bottom of my email is 2 Timothy chapter 1, 6 through 7. And here, God empowers women. Yes, I said that in a Baptist church. God empowers women. I want us to understand that as women of God. That when you look at scripture, it's not just men that God used. God used women to fulfill the kingdom of God, to expand the kingdom of God. And here, what did He give you? The gift of who? The Holy Spirit. You have God living in you. I want that to, to just sit right now and just think about it. God is living in you. And if God is living in you, what does Paul say? He did not give you a spirit of fear. And when we think about the word fear, fear is a driving force in our society today. Am I right? You ever watch the news? It's all about fear, right? This underlying premise of, of, of making people fearful. Fear also gives rise to confused thinking, irrationalities, and misunderstanding. And it's the, the, thing, the truth about it is, when we as women of God begin to doubt God's faithfulness, doubt God's power that's living in you, you begin to fear, saying, well, you know what? I'm not gifted enough. I'm not able to do that. That's a man's job. Now, I want to make it one point. I'm not asking our, our, our women in our church to, to take my job. <laughs> I'm asking the women in our church to become leaders for Christ. And if God calls you to preach, preach the gospel wherever you are. And here, he did not give you a spirit of fear. And understand, yes, it's difficult. And I can't understand it. But the sad truth is, society today still discriminates against women. It's still sad. The pay gap is still very much discriminated. And as, 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 as even as a, as a non, as an Asian man, I, I face inequalities and discrimination, but if you think of it anymore as women, you face a different level of discrimination. But you see, as followers of Christ, you cannot allow what's happening in this world, because the world will be the world, to take the power that you have in Christ away. To put fear in your heart. To put doubt in your heart. But once you realize what Paul is saying, but you did not receive a spirit of fear, but of what? Power. And that word, that Greek word power is dunamis. That is the power of God. And the best example I can explain to you about the power of God is just if you ever go outside in the, very early in the morning while the sun is still not up and you just sit out there in your yard and you allow the sun to just give you this amazing warmth 
But if you stay there too long, what's, what does the sun do? It starts to burn you, doesn't it? It starts to give you so much heat. That's just a small glimpse of the power of God, His creation. And if we can truly tap into the dunamis power that God has given us, the Holy Spirit who lives in us, just like Sojourner True, a woman born into slavery, but did not allow her circumstances to hold her back. As she fought for freedom, as she discovered Christ, God empowered her. I believe God has the same plan for you today. Not only with His power, but what's next? His love. This past Saturday, we had a Bible study in my home, and we, we, we went to, to Unit 3, that God pursues a loving relationship with us. We can never fully love one another until we have experienced God's love. And as women of God, you have been empowered to love not only your husband, not only your children, but to all people, to your neighbors. But you cannot love someone until you've experienced the love of God. And it's not just an experience that you experience one time when you go to church, but it's an everyday experience when you fall in love with Jesus Christ. I really hope that as much as you are in love with your husbands, amen, that you are more in love with God. Sorry, sorry husbands. <laughs> that when you discover your greatest love of all, which is Christ alone, He will give you the desires of your heart. He will give you peace. He will give you clarity of your future, of where you are, as a partner in ministry, as a godly mother, as a leader in your profession. And lastly, self-control. You see, when you discover who Christ is and you follow Him, He changes you, amen? He change, changes you from inside and out. He gives you the power to be bold for Him, to be bold witnesses for Him. He allows you to experience this amazing love, and that love is that agape love, that unconditional love of what the cross displays. And as you grow in maturity, and you begin to have Christ's characteristics, Christ's mind, He gives you self-control. And self-control is wisdom. Self-control is humility. Self-control is saying the right words at the right time. And I believe the only way for you women of God to have self-control is when you're in the Word. When you know the Word inside and out. When you know who the Holy Spirit is in your life. Because you know you have an amazing prayer life with God. That no matter what you face, God is with you. He's giving you self-control. Because the truth is, you're going to face highs and lows. Society will expect this, this, and that. We as men will expect this, this, and that. And the only way for you to continue to pursue Christ and be a godly mother, be a leader in, in this church and in your workplaces, is to be filled with His Word. And His Word gives you self-control. He gives you wisdom. Here's some women in our church that I've been excited about as I have known them in the last nine months. Atia Moore, if you don't know who Atia Moore is, she's here. I don't know if she's here. Yeah. Atia Moore has been an encourager to me and my family. But more than that, she's been an example for me of ministry. She would continue to remind me of these women that she has befriended or worked with. Again, not in a Christian setting, church. And there she would say, Pastor, pray for me as I minister to them. And I said, yes, amen. And I'm so excited to see how God is using her for His kingdom. God is empowering her. 
And yes, I don't have to be there. Because who's with her? The Holy Spirit. God is empowering her. Atifei, you know who Atifei is? I was just with Atifei, with one of her friends. We went out in the country. There is country here in Carolina. And this family owned 10 acres. I was like, wow, 10 acres. Can I get one? And there we were able to minister to their friends and share the gospel. And this was her doing. This was her being led by God himself. And how God used her in, in the ministry in colleges years before. And allowed her to be a beacon of hope and light to students. And still using her today. Amen. And you know what the blessing? Amen. You know blessing how she has been teaching the soaring eagles. And I'm just, I'm just a substitute really. Right? I'm just a substitute. Right? And I'm excited about that. Because as she leads and teaches the soaring eagles Bible study. She's leading with humility, with leadership. And who's guiding her? Not me. Not the elders. The Holy Spirit. Amen. Empowering her. Women of God, women today, God has a plan for you. And that plan is for His glory. The last point is that God is calling you guys to be bold witnesses because you have a holy calling. Yeah. It's understandable to see at times. To feel like, and this is from my perspective, I may be wrong, because I'm a man, that God might favor men, right? Like, oh man. Paul, this and that, and all the Moses, right? Was it why was Moses not a woman? Right? But as you look at perspective, and you look at what God has done in the past, God has utilizes, utilized women in the past to be great agents of change and great influences because they have a holy calling. You have a holy calling. What does 8 and 9 say? Don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me as prisoner. Instead, sharing and suffering for the gospel. Relying on the power of God, He has saved us, called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ before time began. Before you were born, before creation, before the world was created, before time began, God already had a plan for you. Think about that. God already knew who you were, knew your talents, your gifts, your strengths. And here, what does Paul say? Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of your testimony. Don't ever think, oh, Pastor Jane, your testimony is better than mine. No, never. My testimony will reach people that your testimony will also reach different people. Your testimony is as holy and as great as my testimony is. Why? Because it is God who worked through us. And if you think about that, it ought to give you this passion, it ought to give you this excitement and boldness to be a witness for Christ. Because in Matthew 28, the Great Commission, did, did, did you just say, oh, just the men, go and make disciples of the No. All followers of Christ all people of God. And as you become witnesses, what did Paul say? Share in suffering for the gospel. I believe you guys know what that is like. As a mother, as a mother, I would never be able to give birth. Right? I, I remember my first son being born. I was like, man, that's hard. And I can't understand. I'm not going to talk more about it. And I give you guys credit. I give you guys you know, props, because it's hard to be a mother. But as you continue to follow Christ as a mother, God calls you to suffer for Him. And so as you face difficulties, suffer for the gospel. Continue to endure for Him. 
Because the fact is, he knows what you're going through. He knows that it's, it's difficult to be a woman of God in our society today. And it's been like that for ages. But God knows it. And God has a plan for it. What did he say? As you suffer in the gospel, you have the power of who? Relying on the power of God. How will you be able to get through the sufferings that you will go through, even as a young woman or as a grandmother? By relying on the power of God. Because if you're relying on your husband, I'm sorry, we will fail you. If you're relying on your children for joy, which is good, but that's where you're getting your energy and your strength from, they will fail you. If you're relying on your status and your job or your, your, your BFFs, they will fail you. It is only when you rely on the power of your Lord and Savior will you get through the sufferings and the trials you will face during your marriage, during your raising your child, or even the tragedies that you will face. Or the persecutions that you will face for Christ. Rely on the power of God. And as we rely on the power of God, Verse 9 is a beautiful verse. What did Paul say? He has saved us. He has saved you and called you with a holy calling. My calling is the same as yours. And it's holy, set apart. And when you stand in front of God, one day when you die, God will welcome you in and hold you in his arms and call you my daughter. And he will love you as much as he will love me. 